Good evening, everyone. I'm Coach Spivey, joined with my son, Jordan Spivey, and we're going to go over another amazing science tutorial video. And in this video, we're going to be looking at phylogenetic trees and cladograms. So let's get started. Phylogenetic trees and cladograms represent a hypothesis about evolutionary relationships and are ever-changing based on new evidence. So as we discover new organisms and new creatures, these organisms have different features that make them separate or different from other organisms. So our ph phylogenetic trees and cladograms, they adjust and evolve accordingly. Each branch point represents the divergence of two species. So for example, here's a branch point right here. And we can say that the organisms that are up here are vertebrates or they have backbones. And the organisms that are right here are at taxon B and C do not have backbones. Notice this branch point shows a change or a difference in the two. And then sister taxa are groups that share an immediate common ancestor. So for example, taxon B and taxon C have a, an immediate common ancestor located at this point right here. A rooted tree includes a branch to represent the last common ancestor of all taxa in the tree. So here's our ancestral lineage and here's our rooted tree branch right here. And if you notice, this is a common ancestors of all the following taxas over here to the right. And then a, poly a polytomy is a branch from which more than two groups emerge. So here's an example of a polytomy. Taxon D, E, and F are a polytomy because you have more than two or groups of organisms to emerge. So what is phylogeny? Phylogeny is the study of the evolutionary history and relationships among individuals or groups of organisms. Why is phylogeny important? Well, it helps with the understanding and classifying and diversity of life on Earth. So if you take a look, we have three main domains. We have bacteria, archaea, and eukaryota. If you notice, all three of these domains had a common ancestor, but as we go up or as we go through time, as we move up, notice that bacteria branches off by itself, and then archaea and eukaryota are actually on the same branch. And then eventually, archaea branches off by itself, and it leaves eukaryota over here to the right by itself largely use phylogenetic trees to test the evolutionary hypothesis for the following, such as trait evolution, coevolution, mode and pattern of speciation, correlated trait evolution, biogeography, geographic origins, age of different taxa, nature of molecular evolution, disease epidemiology, and many more applications. So we use phylogenetic trees to help us determine so many things. So now let's look at analyzing and interpreting phylogenetic relationships. So first, let me go ahead and put these points in, A, B, C, D, and E. And these represent our different taxons. And if you notice, all of these taxons have a common ancestor right here at this point. So taxons A, B, C, D, and E have a common ancestor at this point. And this is what we call the roots of our tree. Now, if you notice, as our tree moves along across time, here's our ancestors right here, and here's our timeline, and we move along until present day species. As we move across, we notice that they begin to separate or have this process known as speciation, which shows that they have different characteristics and traits where they separate it. And if we keep moving across, we notice that the most recent common ancestor of points A and B are right here. How do we know it's because speciation actually, or a separate branch is created right here. Same thing for points C and D. So speciation occurs at this point right here. So they have a, points C and D have a common ancestor right here. And if you look, points A, B, C, and D are more closely related to each other than point E. How can we tell? Because at this point right here, the organisms on point E, they branch down here. And then the organisms on point A, B, C, and D will come off this exact same branch. So these four end up having more in common than the ones that are on taxon E. So now let's take a look at branching diagrams to show relationships between species or high taxa based on their shared common ancestors. 
So there are two ways we can look at, at phylogenetic trees. So one, we'll see a phylogenetic tree that looks like this. And then two, we'll see a phylogenetic tree that looks like this. They both represent the same thing, but notice on this tree, time is actually moving in this direction. And then on this tree, time is actually moving to the right in that direction. So if you notice, points A and B are most closely related because they share a common ancestor in point E. So if you take a look, here's point E right here, and they both split off right here at point E. So they have a common ancestor in point E. They do not share that same common ancestor with point C and D. So if you notice, point E is right here. C and D are right here, but they do not share that common ancestor. So points A and B will be more closely related than points C and D. And then if you look, A, B, and C are most, more closely related to each other than to D because they share a common ancestor, F, that D does not share. So if we look on this uh, phylogenetic tree, we'll notice the same thing. So we have point F right here, and points A, B, and C have points F, point F in common, but they do not have that in common with point D. Same thing on this tree. Here's point F right here. So A, B, and C share a common ancestor in point F, but point D does not. So now time for your first check for understanding. You're going to analyze the phylogenetic tree and answer the comprehension questions to the right. You have two minutes to do so, and we'll begin those two minutes starting now. Now let's see how you did on your first check for understanding. Number one, what type of organisms do all of the other organisms originate from? So we take a look at the very bottom of this phylogenetic tree, and then let me go ahead and change my color on my pointer option. So if you look at the very bottom, the first organism that they all originate from are prokaryotes. Number two, what are worms closest related to? So here are worms right here. And if you notice, as we move up the phylogenetic tree, they branch off over here. So notice this branch, it doesn't include arthropods. So when they branch off, it doesn't include arthropods. So there's only one other type of organism on this branch right here with worms, and that's going to be our mollusks. Number three, which are more closely related, chordates and mollusks or chordates and hemichordata? So if we look, let's move up, and we branch off over here. Here are our chordates, and here are our hemichordata. And i go ahead and erase this, move this out of the way so you can see. So, and then here are our mollusks. If you notice... Chordates and hemichordata are on the same branch with each other. They And if you notice, mollusks are on a different branch. So it can't be mollusks. So chordates are more closely related to hemichordata than they are to mollusks. mollusks. Why? Because they branch off the same, they come off the same branch. And then number four, which organism are Cnidaria least related to on their branch? Let's take a look. So here's our, here are Cnidaria. They have a close relationship with comb jellies because they come off that same branch. And then if we go down even further, they come off the same branch with sponges. But they do not come off that same branch, and they speciate or differentiate right here. So they do not come off the same branch. So they're going to have going to be least related to Placozoa. So what is the difference between a phylogenetic tree and a cladogram? Many biologists use phylogenetic trees and cladograms interchangeably, both because both are based on ancestral relationships. Some scientists associate phylogenetic trees with showing evolutionary history over time, while some scientists consider cladograms to represent hypotheses about a group of organisms' ancestry based on a common trait, usually physical in nature. So if you look at the following cladogram right here, 
if you notice that they are speciated usually by a physical trait. So here's heterotroph right here. But as we move up here are vertebra, which means that they have a backbone. And then here's two part limbs. We have fur and we have feathers. Notice that these are physical traits. So what is the difference between the phylogenetic tree and a cladogram? Phylogenetic trees branch lengths can represent the amount of genetic change or are proportional to time. So this phylogenetic tree shows that this line right here represents time and this shows how often or how soon the speciation occurs. And then in cladograms, the branch lengths are usually considered to be arbitrary or which basically means the branch lengths don't necessarily mean that the longer the branch, then the longer the time. So how to read a cladogram? This diagram shows a relationship between four relatives and these relatives share a common ancestor at the root of the tree. So if you look down at the bottom, here's that common ancestor at this root. If you notice that this diagram is also a timeline. So we start from the past at the bottom and as we go up, we become, go to the more recent or present. The older organism is always at the bottom of this tree. So here's the oldest organism or the oldest ancestor. And then the four descendants at the top of the tree are different species. This is called speciation. And the way we can tell is that speciation occurs at these different points. So if you notice at this point right here, it branches off and point one goes right here. Here's a descendant one right here. Then if we go up even further, descendant two branches off right here. We go up even further, here's descendant three, it branches off and then here's descendant four and this is called speciation once again. So let's take a closer look at how to read a cladogram. And remember, our time on cladograms, on this cladogram specifically, it starts down at the bottom and it goes up. So this right here, here's our time. And remember, our oldest ancestor is going to be at the very bottom or at the root of this cladogram. And if we go up, notice they have a common ancestor of A, B, and C at this point because they are on this same branch. As we go up, we have speciation with descendant C right here. And then if we keep going up, if we go to the right, here's a speciation with descendant B. So, and then here's speciation with descendant A. If you notice, points A or descendants A and B have a common ancestor because they branch off together right here. And then descendant A has a unique ancestor because it's off over here by itself. And then if you look, if you notice, there's a shared history of A and B, which we said or stated earlier. How can we tell? Because descendant C, when they branched off, descendant C went over here, but descendants A and B went over here together. And then there's a unique history of A, and then there's a unique history of B. So if you notice, at this point, speciation occurred, which gave them point, uh, descendants A and descendants B, different traits or characteristics. So now let's take a look at analyzing and interpreting cladograms and we'll work through this one together. So number one, what trait separates lampreys from tuna on this cladogram? So let's locate our lamprey. So here's our lamprey right here. And then here's our tuna. As we move up this cladogram, remember time is moving up like that. So I put my time right here. As we move up, they have a vertebral column in, com in common, but they do not have jaws in common. So lampreys do not have jaws, but tunas do have jaws. So what trait separates them? Jaws. And then let's take a look at number two. What separates a salamander from a turtle? So here's a salamander right here, and here's a turtle. As we move up, all both of them share vertebral columns, jaws, and four walking legs. But if you notice, amniotic egg comes after the salamander, and then the turtle would have this amniotic egg. So what trait separates a salamander from a turtle? And that's going to be the amniotic egg. Number three, which organism is most related to the leopard? So let's go ahead and move this other stuff out of the way so you can see. 
So as we go up our cladogram over time, if you notice, the last branching off is going to be between the turtle and the leopard. So the turtle is going to be most closely related to the leopard because they have the closest branch in common. And then number four, what four traits do these two organisms share? So if we look at a turtle and leopard, both of them share a vertebral column. So I'm just going to put vert C. They both share jaws. And they both have four walking legs. And I'll abbreviate that. So four walking legs. And they both share an amniotic egg. So and I'll abbreviate that amniotic egg. And how can we tell? Because we, as we go up over time, they have the vertebral column, the jaws, four walking legs, amniotic egg. But the one thing they don't have in common is hair. Number five, which organism will have DNA most similar to the turtle? Well, as we move up along this cladogram, we notice that the turtle and a leopard branch off at the last branch. So it's going to be the leopard. Then number six, which organism DNA will differ the most from the leopard? So here's our leopard. Here's our leopard all the way over here. And if you notice, all the way on the other side is going to be our lancelet. So which organism DNA will differ the most from the leopard? And it's going to be our Lancelot. It's time for your second check for understanding. And you're going to analyze the following cladogram and answer the questions below. You have two minutes to do so and we'll begin those two minutes starting now. So now let's see how you did on your second check for understanding. Number seven, what trait separates amphibians from primates on this cladogram? So we notice here are amphibians and here are primates. As we move up through time, we notice that primates have an amniotic egg, but amphibians do not. Number eight, what separates rabbits and primates from crocodiles on this cladogram? It would actually be two things, hair and eggs with shells. So if you look, if we go up, Primates and rabbits share hair, but crocodiles don't have hair. And if you keep going up, crocodiles have eggs with shells, but primates and rabbits do not. Number nine, which organism is most related to the bird on this cladogram? If we move up through time, crocodiles and birds have a recent ancestor at this point. So the crocodile is going to be most related to the bird. Number 10, what five traits do these two organisms share? They both share vertebrae, a bony skeleton, four limbs, amniotic egg, and eggs with shells. Number 11, which organism will have DNA most similar to the bird? Well, since crocodiles and birds have the most recent ancestor right here, it would be a crocodile. Then number 12, which organism DNA will differ the most from the bird? If you notice, the bird is all the, way, uh, all the way over here, and sharks are all the way over here. So they branch off very early on, so the shark would have the most different DNA from the bird. Ladies and gentlemen, I hope this science tutorial was helpful. I'm Chavis Spivey, signing off with my son Jordan Spivey. Peace, and y'all have a wonderful day.